in the next part, we'll, um, we'll go a little bit beyond that. So we'll discuss a few extensions of this basic technique, which is very easy to comprehend, but there's tweaks and twists that one can apply to get even more out of it. And we'll also cover a few more interesting with machine learning um, uh, aspects there. So um, the first little consideration is this. LDA gives you basically, um, if you apply it on linear to linear filters, the same effective result as if you had applied it to linearly transformed data. So if you had swizzled the channels, for example, or rescaled them or whatever, well, uh, you know, um, you would have gotten the same performance because LDA would have just learned different weights. So if you apply this to principal components of the data or independent components or whatever, you still get basically the same result as long as you don't throw information away here. As long, okay. So that's just a feature of this whole process being linear. If you're looking at something nonlinear like oscillations, that absolutely doesn't hold anymore. So suddenly, uh, you truly do get a difference when you apply a method to, say, ICA versus raw channels. It's just in this case, we're very lucky that, that we can basically solve it all the way through uh, with one method in its optimum. However, um, if you have decompositions like independent component analysis, which gives you source time courses, then um, essentially LDA assigns you a weight not to every channel, but to every component. And so suddenly you can say, this component here of the signal, like the blinks, are this relevant. And that component, like a muscle, is that relevant. And so you can reason and say things such as, I am not using muscular activation, so it doesn't depend on artifacts. Or I can say, um, I'm primarily using an independent component that with dipole fitting, I managed to localize in the motor cortex. And so you can suddenly interpret these classifiers relatively easily. And furthermore, you can basically introduce extra constraints that are informed by where these components sit in the brain. So uh, again, uh, ICA is a very strong uh, method to give you something that relates to source space. I say a few things in the last lecture on that. You can say, I don't want to use components that don't come from occipital cortex because I'm using a visual process here. I don't think my signal originates from here, at least not the signal that I want to use. So these things uh, suddenly become possible. And uh, so that's the various trade-offs. The other one is there's other linear features that you can use instead of averages. Averages are very simple to, to describe and calculate and think about, but they're not necessarily particularly well tuned to what you really want. If you know that your underlying ERP comes in certain kinds of forms like ripples <laughs> like these, then you could use linear combinations that do basically an, it, an inner product with, with this time course uh, to get to basically do pattern matching with that. Um, so that is an example of a wavelet decomposition here. So it's a linear transform uh, which allows you to, um, you know, to use wavelet features. And so you can pick a small number of wavelet features to, to to find features of your linear features of your EOP and classify in terms of those. If you, uh, that only makes sense if you throw away many of them <laughs> to reduce dimensionality. If you use all of them, again, it's linear, you know. Um, you could have as well used the raw chunk of data and through a classifier edit. So it's a way of dimensionality reduction. Also, what these features happen to do is um, usually only a small number of these coefficients actually contain the information that you're looking for. And so you can say things such as, my classifier should use only a small number of non-zero coefficients. And there's various ways to learn these kinds of classifiers. We'll say a few things about that. It's this sparsity notion. And so with these features, you can make use of these kinds of things. It doesn't apply, say, to channels. The signal is not sparse in a channel. It projects everywhere, right? But with these kinds of things, you can start making use of these assumptions. There is also, of course, the whole area of nonlinear features. So obviously, that is, that is the general class of features. Linear is a special case. And the problem with that is that if you are, what you actually want is you want nonlinear features that are f features of the source time course. 
because uh, you think there's a source process that does something, and maybe there's a nonlinear property of that, as opposed to nonlinear features of the channels. So if you do nonlinear transform somewhere in your feature extraction on channels, and then apply a classifier, you've basically done it the wrong way. You've applied the, the nonlinear part sort of too early. You had the proper way would have been to first design a spatial filter which gets you to the source, which is a big linear part, then do your nonlinear feature extraction, so, um, whatever that might be, and then maybe apply a classifier to that. But that's sort of a three-stage thing. You know, it's linear, nonlinear, linear, and there's uh, only a small number of methods that properly learn all these parameters in a way where you can say that's going to be the optimal solution. In many cases, it's patchwork. So um, in practice, it's very hard to, um, to deal properly with arbitrary nonlinear features in EEG. It's different in, say, fMRI, where you don't have as much of a volume conduction problem and so on, but in EEG, it's sort of tricky. Uh, although there's, there's special classes where you can do it. And uh, uh, one, one condition, for example, that allows you to do it is to learn the spatial filters irrespective of the class labels um, using things like ICA and then do nonlinear features on your independent components and then use a classifier. But I'm, I'm going to talk about these things uh, later. There's, there's a more important aspect and that is when you, uh, when you have things such as you want to detect um, a signal in noise or so, such as you want to detect whether the person saw a target image or something like that, as opposed to not having seen it. Cases where you have different um, ratio, uh, let's say, where the prior probability that he see saw nothing is much higher than the probability that he saw something. So where there's this imbalance. Or in cases where certain kinds of errors um, of the PCI are much more costly than others, such as false positive or the false negative, then you want to use um, maybe different criteria to optimize these things, incorporate the costs, for example. Uh, and you also want to use different measures to estimate how well you, what the performance of your system is. Misclassification rate doesn't get you very far, for example, if 90% of your trials are one class. And if you always say that class is the true class, you are 90% correct on average, <laughs> right? So one way to, to measure one pretty nice general purpose way of dealing with inbounds classes is the area under curve or area under receiver operator curve. And it's um, uh, if your model has a tunable threshold, basically, where it says A versus B, you know, class A versus class B. Uh, for different values of this threshold, you can basically go all the way from 0% false positive rate to, to 100%. And for any given false positive rate, you have an associated true positive rate. Uh, in the ideal case, you, um, for 0% false positives, you have 100% true positive. So you're always getting it right. You're never getting it wrong, basically. Um, so the curve, uh, the area and the curve would be 1. If you are at random chance, it's basically 0.5. You know, you gain one in the false positives, you lose one in the in the true positives, basically, um, or uh, you know, gain gain one there. So um, that's a way that can be sort of applied post hoc to any classifier that happens to produce continuous scalar outputs, like a regression technique or so. It say predicts the probability that you saw um, a plane. <laughs> on a satellite image or something like that. Um, I, sh I should say one more thing, and that is, um, let's say, um, actually, I think I've already said this. So uh, th there is classifiers which can be directly optimized, say, under the area on the curve criterion. There's classifiers that can optimize various other scores, F scores, and so on. And for example, the support vector framework has several rather advanced um, ways to, to learn classifiers under these sophisticated cost functions. So um, if you're in such a situation, that would be a, a place to look. And, and that ends um, this module.